Today we are looking at Junior, the female apostle. Now often you might ask, where did you find a female apostle in the Bible? Well, Romans 16 verse 7. It reads, Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are standing among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. This is written by Paul. So Paul is saying here that Adronica and Junia is his fellow Jews. The translation could also be, the actual translation is actually my relatives who have been in prison, prison with me. They were standing among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. So here Paul is actually saying that these two people are relatives of his. They were in prison with him and they were Christians before he became a Christian. Now this is just a slide of the original Greek. This comes from the Strong's Concordance. For those of you that don't know what the Strong's Concordance is, the Strong's Concordance is basically... All the Hebrew and all the Greek words from the Bible translated to English. Um, Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek, which was obviously the very original language that the Bible was written in. And the Strong's Concordance is just translating those different languages. Now you can see here, the original Greek in this particular scripture was Ionian and the translation for Ionian is Junia and that is the female Junia. Now the first person to expound on Romans 16 verse 7 was the early church father Origen of Alexandria and he understood the name Junia to be feminine. Other prominent church fathers and theologians who recognized Junia as a woman were people like Jerome, who translated the Latin Vulgate, Hatton of Vesely, he was a bishop and Greek scholar, and you can see when he lived in 924 to 961, so it means up until that time, people still believed that she was a female. Then there's Theophilac who lived in 1050 to 1108, and Peter Abelard in 10 to, uh, 1079 to 1142. He was a French theologian and philosopher, and you can see up until that time, people still saw Junia as a female, and not a single commentator on the text mentioned Junia as a male. John Chrysostom, in the 4th century, made it crystal clear that Junia was a woman and an apostle, apostle when he wrote, To be an apostle is something great, but to be outstanding among the apostles. Just think what a wonderful song of praise that is. How great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. So you can see even in the 4th century, John Christicism, still made it crystal clear that Junia was a female and she was an apostle, apostle. Now the first time the name changed was in 1245 to 1316 during the life of Agedius of Rome and he only assumed the name to be masculine. Agedius offered no textual or historical evidence to support the, his belief that Junior was a man. He simply made the passing comment about how these two women, oh, sorry, these two men must have been honourable. Now how did Junior then have a sex change? This change took place in approximately 1298 which was during the reign of Pope Boniface VIII. Benedict Catani reigned from 1294 to 1303. You will remember that the first person to record the two as men was Agedius in Rome. He was a contemporary of Pope Boniface VIII. The Catholic Encyclopedia goes on to tell us 
that this Pope was accused of infidelity, heresy, simony, gross and unnatural immorality, adultery, magic, loss of the Holy Land, and he was also accused of the death of Celestine V. When King Philip IV of France brought these charges against him, five archbishops, 21 bishops, and some abbots sided with the king. This evil man had persuaded the Pope before him, Celestine V, to resign, and then following his own election as Pope, he imprisoned the old man until his death. One famous quote from Boniface VIII is, It is altogether necessary to salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. So here we can see he basically said if you want to be saved you have to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Now a papal decision that dealt directly with religious women was the papal bull known as Periculuso, which was the first word of the Latin text. This decree of 1298 announced that all nuns, no matter what their rank was or what rule they observed, and no matter where their monasteries were located, all nuns were to be perpetually cloistered. Unless a nun became contagiously ill, she could not leave her monastery or invite unauthorized persons into the monastery. Once they had been free to come and go on their own religious business and ministries, now nuns were to be totally separated and no longer free to come and go as they wished. This was a milestone decision and transformed mon monasteries into virtual prisons. One order of nuns threw the bishop delivering this decree out of their covenant and tossed the edict along after him. One reason given for this decree was for their safety. But soon afterwards many safe monasteries out in the country were closed and relocated to cities. So this reason did not really seem valid. Boniface may well have wished to limit the power and influence of the women of the church. Many nuns protested, but the edict remained in and still continues to this day. Nuns never regained the freedom they had before the edict of 1298. Monasteries of women were famous for producing their own copyists and eliminators of manuscripts. Therefore, these nun Bible copyists and educated nuns among them, such as Gertrude the Great, who lived in that same period, who wrote Herald of Divine Love, would have been able to cite Junia as apostle from the biblic biblical records of Romans. Did Boniface VIII also rule that Junia would henceforth be considered a male? Cons conclusive evidence eludes us. But we do know that about the same time as this edict against nuns, medieval biblical commentators began referring to Junia as a male. The first person Dr. Swidler cites to do so is Agedius of Rome. If this is the same man as Agedius Colonna, the Archbishop Bishop of Burgos, who helped Boniface write one of his major papal bulls, then we have a direct link to Boniface VIII. Another shocking change occurred at about the same time. And that is, Junior becomes Junius. Without exception, the Church Fathers in late antiquity identified Atronicus's partner in Romans 16 verse 7 as a woman, as did Minuscule 33 of the 9th century, which records Ionia, which is the Greek for Junia, with an acute accent. Only later medieval copyists of Romans 17 verse 7 could not imagine a woman being an apostle and wrote the masculine name Ionius with an S. So they've added the S 
and change the female name into a male name. This later name, Junius, did not exist in antiquity. Its explanation as a Greek abbreviation of the Latin name Junianus is unlikely. At about the time of Pope Boniface's edict, removing the freedom of nuns in 1298, copiers began writing the name Junia as Junius. Yet recent research has shown that the newly created name Junius didn't even exist at the time of Paul. This hypothetical name Junius is, however, as yet unattested in ancient inscriptions, but the female Latin name Junia occurs over 250 times among inscriptions from ancient Rome alone. Further, the ancient translations and the earliest manuscripts with accents supporting support reading Ionian as Junia. Finally, Junius would be an irregular form. Therefore, critical scholars today increasingly interpret the name as the feminine Junia. Junia was a very common Latin female name and we have no record of any Roman male bearing the name Junia. But medieval copiers began copying the name with an S to hide Junia's sex, not knowing that the name Junius did not exist in antiquity. So Junia received a fictitious name, possibly at the command of Pope Boniface VIII. So now that they've discovered that they actually can't get away with changing the name from a female name, Junia, to a male name, Junius, they decided, well, okay, then we have to change something else. And we must just say, okay, she was a female, but she wasn't among the apostles. She was only well known to the apostles. If we go back to the original Greek, we can see in Strong's Concordance that the original Greek for among is en, en. And that word en is called, is translated among. Now, they're arguing, because many mentally read this scripture and add several of their own words. They are said to be outstanding among. Here they, re they substitute the among by the apostles. So they are adding said to be and by the apostle, apostles. And those words are not in the original Greek. Changing among and adding the other four words totally changes the meaning of this scripture. However, these four words, said to be and by, are not in the Greek text at all. In studying scriptures, we cannot just randomly add words or change the words that are there. For the Greek meaning by, Paul would have used one of two do totally different Greek words, and they are para or pros, rather than using en, en, which implies selection from within a group. Paul never relied on the opinions of other apostles to back his teaching or his praise. He knew these two very well, having been in prison with them. Why would he be saying that others thought they were outstanding? He knew them best and he was praising them as outstanding or eminent among the apostles. Paul considered them apostles just as he considered himself to be apostle. They were part of the group called apostles. They were apostles and were setting an outstanding example. Now the Wycliffe Bible Commentary states, Paul describes them as being prominent among the apostles and as having been Christians before him. 
the United Bible Society's Handbook Series, an acknowledged authority composed of a board of respected translators, first acknowledges that they are a male-female team. Adronicus and Junius could easily have been husband and wife or brother and sister. They acknowledge that some misunderstood the sentence to mean the apostles know them well, but a far more acceptable interpretation would imply that these were counted as apostles and were well known. For example, as apostles they are well known. So, they decided if we can't argue that Junius was a male, or Junior was a male, that name existed, they can't prove it exists, so we'll change the rest of the scripture and we'll say that, yes, okay, Junior was a female, but she was merely well known to the apostles. Now, this interpretation asserts that Junior was most likely a woman, but was simply well known to the apostles or highly favored by the apostles, but was not an apostle herself. However, if this was the correct and most natural understanding of Romans 16 verse 7, then copyists would not have stooped so low as to blatantly changing the text. This was a desperate and theologically motivated alteration to change the gender of Junia without any textual or historical warrant. If the verse simply meant that a woman was well known by the apostles, there would have been no controversy, no deceptive tactics to mask Junia's gender in male trappings in the first place. No one on either side of the debate ever questioned whether Paul was deeming these two apostles, but only whether or not Junior was male or female. So this new interpretation emerged as a last-ditch effort in the face of indisputable evidence that Junior was in fact a woman. It aims to disprove the notion that a woman could ever be a rightful apostle. You see, men just don't want women to have any form of role, leadership role in the church. And you can see clearly that they've gone to all sorts of extremes to prevent that. First, they change the name from a female name to a male name. When it's later discovered and pointed out, then fine, they will change the name back, they'll admit it was a female. But then they will go and change the rest of the scripture to make it sound like, yes, okay, she was a female, but she was only well known by the apostles. But if she was just well known, why go through all that effort to change her name to a male name if she was purely well known among? And the sad thing is, that since, 12th, since the 12th century, when all this happened, until the 20th century, that's 700 years, 800 years, that women were prevented from having any role in the church. Imagine how far, how much further the gospel could have been spread if this was just left alone. Now the most natural way to read the Greek phrase is that both were apostles some modern interpreters have rejected this reading mainly because they presuppose that women could never fill this office. The original Greek nor the historical reading does not support this complementarian interpretation. It's basically grammatical gymnastics employed to cast flimsy doubt upon the validity of a woman apostle. The fact that Junia was imprisoned with Paul should tell us that this woman was a public figure who was considered a leader in the church. The whole point of Romans arresting and killing Christians was to make an example of the boldest ones and most influential ones so other Christians would be deterred from following suit. Had this woman remained silent 
in the assemblies and never dared to preach or teach the gospel to men, it hardly makes any sense as to why she would have found herself behind bars. History bears witness to the fact that the large majority of Christians captured, imprisoned and martyred were public figures and leaders within the early church, men and women alike. So, as you can see, it appears that men have always tried through various ways to keep women from teaching or preaching or holding any form of office in the church or, you know, just downplaying women into roles of being prayer warriors. That's all women are good for. They have to be prayer warriors and do the admin office, which is also part of spiritual gifts, but God gave everyone spiritual gifts according to the Holy Spirit's liking. And it's not up to me or you to say that the Holy Spirit can't give you the gift of teaching. But they've always tried to base everything on what Paul said. And they would refer to things like Corinthians, where Paul said the woman has to be silent. And things that Paul said um, that women are not to teach. But, you know, throughout my research on this topics, on the various topics on females in the church. Um, I've read so many blogs and I've read so many websites and commentaries and works from various people and um, I have never noticed anyone anywhere put in one more scripture that Paul said. And I don't know why they don't add that specific scripture, but if you want to look at what Paul said, then I think you must also look at other things Paul said. And there's one very prominent scripture that stands out to me a lot more than any of these other scriptures about what Paul said. And that is... Galatians 3 verse 28 There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Now, this radical affirmation of unity and equality in Christ is a deliberate rejection of the attitude expressed by the synagogue prayer in which the worshipper thanks God for not making him a gentile, a slave or a woman. Such an attitude of superiority contradicts the truth of the gospel, the good news that there is equality and unity of all believers in Christ. When men exclude women from significant participation in the life and ministry of the church, they negate the essence of the gospel. Some will argue that the equality Paul defends here is only in the spiritual sphere, equality before God. But Paul's argument responds to a social crisis in the church. Gentiles were being forced to become Jews to be fully accepted by Jewish Christians. Paul's argument is that Gentiles do not have to become Jews to participate fully in the life of the church. Neither do blacks have to become white or females become male for full participation in the life and ministry of the church. The equality of all believers before God must be demonstrated in social relationships within the church if the truth of the gospel is to be expressed. Mr. F. Bruce puts it succulently, no more restriction is implied in Paul's equalization of the status of male and female in Christ than in his equalizing of the status of Jew and Gentile or of slave and free person. If an ordinary life existence in Christ is manifested openly in church fellowship, 
than if a Gentile may exercise spiritual leadership in church as freely as a Jew or a slave as freely as a citizen, why not a woman as freely as a man? So you either believe that all members in church in, the, in Christ's body are equal or you have to believe that Paul contradicts himself. And that will just open a whole new can of worms. So at the end of the day, you have to choose. Did Paul contradict himself throughout scripture where at one point he says, women can't do this, women can't do that, women can't do that, yet there's no difference anymore between female and male? Or are we reading or taking things out of context, reading it with the understanding of what was happening out of the time, and or physically changing scripture to suit our agenda. We can clearly see that happening with the junior scripture. But perhaps we should go and look at the other scriptures that Paul is referring to. I've got another video on YouTube. It's not my own. It's Dr. Diane uh, McDonald's video where she beautifully explains what Paul meant with women not to teach and um, I will also follow with further videos on various aspects on females but if you're not going to be open-minded if you are set in your ways you would not like those videos because there are men out there that refuse to listen or to read about what Paul meant and what was going on at the time when Paul wrote things. And if you are not interested in knowing the facts because you want to take scripture at face value, then you're never going to understand what Paul meant. In conclusion, I want to say that some suggest, and I've seen this when I've done research, some suggest that there seems to be evidence that strongly suggests Junior was a male, and I quoted that from that person's website. No, there is no evidence to suggest that the name Junius with a S ever existed in Paul's day. There's no biblical proof and there's no secular proof or any evidence that that name ever existed. So if you seem, if you say there seems to be evidence that suggests that she was a male, or Junior was a male, then please, the Jews have done all the research, the Hebrews, the Romans, everyone has been looking for this evidence. If you've got evidence that they can't seem to find, Please share it with all of us because we all want to. We are all looking for that evidence and none of us can appear to find it. So if you want to write on your website, there seems to be evidence, please provide it. Some suggest that Junior may have been an apostle, but not a prominent one, not one with full authority in the church. While well, evidence shows that Paul clearly found her to be prominent enough to mention in scripture, and why would she have been imprisoned? And even John Christosom mentioned her already in the 4th century as an apostle. And if she wasn't prominent, why would he even mention her? So, yes, if you don't like the facts, you will try and change scriptures. You will conveniently not read scriptures in their context you'll take things out of context and you will not worry about what was happening at the time when these scriptures were written but the facts are that Junior was an apostle and Junior was female God bless you